Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you and your families are in a safe place and doing well. Uh, welcome to today's session focused on helping adults identify uh, key health and financial resources uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we're truly in an unprecedented times. We know a large, large, large number of our students, unfortunately, are, are really struggling. Many have lost their jobs or been furloughed, hopefully temporarily. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about some resources that we feel may be of help uh, during these difficult times. Um, FLC has been working for years to um, uh, promote health and financial literacy. Sorry, I went ahead too far. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our programs, uh, providing a contextualized teaching approach uh, that is really needed more than ever. And through the support of Florida Blue uh, and Wells Fargo, uh, we've been able to make grants available to programs interested in doing just this. Uh, so in partnership with a lot of local programs such as yours, uh, we've seen some really good results. Uh, we've just completed the 2020 application and selection process for the health literacy grants uh, and pending approval from Wells Fargo, which we're keeping our fingers crossed and about to apply for that. Uh, we traditionally open up our applications for financial literacy grants in the summer. So uh, be on the lookout for that if, if this is a, an area of interest for you. Having a little bit difficulty advancing the slides here. There we go. Okay. Um, a, a big thanks to the Florida Department of Education for helping to make this session possible. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Heather Surrency, uh, who is our Health and Financial Literacy Program Coordinator. I did want to note that this um, this webinar will be recorded, so um, and it'll be available on our website. Um, uh, probably in a few days. So if it's something that you want to share with your colleagues, uh, feel free to do so. So, Heather. Thank you, Greg, and welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, as Greg said, I'm Heather Cerency, and I'm the Health and Financial Literacy Coordinator at the Florida Literacy Coalition. So first, I just wanted to out outline our objectives for the day. Um, we're going to identify high quality plain language COVID-19 educational materials. We're going to identify ways to incorporate COVID-19 health and financial literacy information into your curriculum. And I hope you'll be able to identify at least three, probably more types um, of economic assistance available to individuals and small businesses in Florida. So I want you just to take a moment uh, before we start and type one word into the chat box that describes how you're feeling today. So as Nicole said in your panel uh, for GoToWebinar, there's a chat box. And if you could just uh, give us an idea of just one word that could describe how you're feeling today. So before we dive into all the health and financial resources that we're going to be covering today, I think it's really important for us to take the time to reflect on how we're reacting both personally and professionally to this crisis. So as we interact with our colleagues and other students, um, we'll likely see a wide range of responses to what is really this new normal that we're all navigating. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge th this impact before we move forward. So while our governor may not consider adult educators as essential, I believe that we are essential because we have a special relationship with our students um, that really provide us with a unique opportunity to assist them through both the response of this COVID-19 emergency as well as the recovery, which we're thinking is going to take months to years. So as we think about how to assist and educate adult learners, I think we need to view the expectations that we have of ourselves and also of our students through the lens of how this sudden change has impacted us all. And so I think it's really difficult when we look at cultural norms. People are trying to celebrate birthdays and holidays. 
uh, and religious practices. So if we can really kind of view this through um, additionally the cultural norms of our students, I think we can have some really good conversations. I was in a webinar yesterday where um, an African American participant talked a little bit about what it's like for an African American male to go into a store with a mask on. I think things like this that we don't normally realize uh, really impact how we view healthcare, whether we trust healthcare, how we view some of these practices that are being asked of us. So it really is a big deal. And as Greg mentioned, I mean, for many um, of our students and also our family and friends, um, they may not have security in their job or in uh, their financial situation. We're being required to be very literate in the area of both health information, financial information, and media in general. Uh, for many of us, this loss of control is causing a lot of stress and anxiety, and we're obviously worried. So we're trying to navigate all of this, learn new information, learn new skills, new ways of living when we have all of these kinds of stressors uh, involved in our life. So just to touch back, did Nicole, did we have anybody put any uh, emotions in the chat box? We have lots of emotions represented here. <laughs> I'd love to hear a few. Um, so, yeah, um, so we've got overwhelmed, um, tired, okay, <laughs> just okay. We got a couple of those. Um, relaxed, um, depressed, hopeful, um, uh, and unfocused are some of the uh, some of the emotions that came up here. Thanks for sharing. So, and I find that uh, talking with colleagues and talking with friends and family that these emotions can change. Right? Sometimes we're feeling hopeful. Sometimes we're feeling overwhelmed. Um, so I just think it's important for us to recognize together and as individuals where we're at um, and how we can continue to, to move through this. So first we're going to talk a bit about health resources for adult learners. Um, in this webinar, we're really going to focus a little bit more on the financial assistance, uh, purely uh, because of where we are right now in this crisis. But I want to just point out a few high quality resources to you. Um, and let you know that FLC is here to support you. So if you have questions or if you're looking for resources you haven't been able to find, please let me know. Uh, because I think this is a really difficult time. Um, I love this graphic because this is how I have felt for the last week. There's so much information coming at us, right? Through social media, through news, through TV, um, through talking to our neighbors or our colleagues. So I think as us as educators, as well as when we are thinking about how to communicate with adult learners, we need to select a few simple, clear, concise resources to communicate our message. And I'll tell you, as a public health practitioner, um, public health professionals have really been struggling with this a bit. Um, but I think we're really starting in the last couple of weeks to see some good plain language, picture-based materials. So I'm guessing that a lot of you have already communicated the basics probably within your organization uh, and to your adult learners. But I just wanted to touch on it really quickly. Um, we want to have good, concise, clear prevention guidelines. Uh, this graphic right here is from the Florida Department of Health, and I think they have done a fantastic job at providing uh, us with resources. So if you, um, you'll see throughout this, I have lots of different resources. Anything that has an underline is a resource uh, link. So I may not go through all of the resources today, uh, but once you get a copy of this presentation, which will be available at the end, I hope that you'll go through and look at all of these different resources. Florida Department of Health is one that I think is really high quality. Um, hand washing is another uh, important uh, prevention guideline, social distancing. On Monday, CDC started to talk to us about wearing masks. So I know there's been lots of discussion about that. Um, as educators, I really think we need to stick with a few, as I said, high quality um, resources. Uh, CDC has some good information. So as opposed to telling people about a YouTube video or a Pinterest picture or something like that, CDC gave us some good specific guidelines. And I just want to point out a few things about the masks because there's a lot of confusion about them. Um, CDC did not recommend them previously because I believe they were concerned about stockpiling. Um, also, I think they are concerned that people will feel a false sense of protection. The goal of the mask is to keep our germs in um, so really the theory, I think, with using masks is if we are all keeping our germs in, it will reduce transmission. It does not, though, help 
um, prevent people from getting the coronavirus. So I think that's a really important factor for us to discuss with students. Another useful um, resource by CDC is the symptom checker. So they have a great resource here on their website about uh, symptoms and testing. So you can click on this and find out a little bit more about both of those. But I really like this self checker. So it asks you a few demographic questions to start on um, where you live, how old you are. Um, but if you have students that are concerned about whether they should be tested or not, I think this is a great place to go. So it will ask, are you answering this for yourself or somebody else? Um, it asks how old you are. And then it will start asking about symptoms. So first they ask about life-threatening symptoms. If I click on one of these, it's going to tell me I should call 911. Um, and then it continues on through different levels of symptoms and it would recommend if you would be a good candidate for testing or not. Um, so I think this can be useful for somebody who might have some cold symptoms or might have some um, symptoms are just not sure whether they fall within the category um, of needing to be tested. So once we've kind of pushed out the basics, um, and you can do that through emails, you can do that through websites, you can uh, do that a variety of ways. Um, we really just want to keep a, a, in mind that we should be simple in our communications. So again, on the left, this is a picture of the Florida Department of Health website. A lot of great information, as I said, it's presented in a very clear way. Um, and a special note down here, um, they do have a phone number um, and an email address that anyone can use if they have questions about whether they should be tested, where they could be tested, how to care for someone, anything. Um, that's a great resource uh, for us specifically in Florida. And again, CDC has um, some pretty good clear uh, simple materials as well. The Texas Department of Health put this together, and I think picture-based uh, messages, especially for our lower level learners um, and English speakers is really important. So this first line of pictures can very quickly and graphically explain to us how do we prevent COVID-19. The second list of pictures shows us who might be at higher risk, although we know we're all potentially at risk. Um, it's called a novel virus because it is a new virus in which uh, none of us have immunity to. And then also they have these clear pictures of their symptoms. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. I would just encourage you to find two or three high quality, clear resources and stick to those. So um, once we've got kind of that basic uh, information, um, we can start to expand it a little bit to the virtual classroom. And I know that each of you is probably at a different place in terms of having classes online, um, but this is something I think we can start to consider. Uh, how can we teach our students more about uh, COVID-19 while still addressing the need to uh, improve their English language skills and their adult that's basic education skills? So here's a few examples of what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm continuing to develop new uh, activities and new projects that you can do online. So please check back to our website kind of over the next week or so to see new uh, ideas. So on the left, we can see there's a worksheet. Uh, it's written for an intermediate level student. We also have one that's written for a lower level student. Uh, the second page of the worksheet has questions. So this could be used online. Uh, students and teachers could read this together or they could work in pairs. However, uh, you're kind of trying to um, teach your students at this time. At the bottom, uh, this is a great activity that was put together. So we're building vocabulary, we're building English language, we're building um, sentence structure and grammatical skills by using examples of words that are common in the COVID-19 vocabulary. Speaking of vocabulary, we put together a Quizlet, little quiz. Uh, and I think most of you have probably seen Quizlet before. It's used a lot, especially in K-12. But what a great online way for our students to learn more about the vocabulary that's associated with COVID-19. So I don't know if you can hear that, but we do have audio as well. You can have slower audio or faster audio. So once I've looked at it, we can move on to a new one. There's also quizzes and other games uh, that students can play to work on the vocabulary skills. Nicole, any questions or comments at this point that I can address? 
Um, there are no questions right now. Okay, just wanted to check in. So feel free if you have a question or a comment, again, as Nicole mentioned, or a resource, please share it in the chat box um, because it's gonna take all of us working together to uh, find the best resources and help our adult learners through this process. So as Greg mentioned, we do have a health literacy program at um, FLC and we have our staying healthy curriculum, which is very widely used. In fact, more than a million times um, our curriculum has been downloaded. So I wanted to just kind of show you some examples of ways that this could be used in the digital classroom. Uh, if you haven't used Staying Healthy before, we have student booklets and we also have instructor guides. So here on the left, you can see this is an example from our instructor guide of the blue or the intermediate, as we call it, um, Staying Healthy book. And it's a pronunciation guide for common vocabulary terms that might be used in a doctor's office or hospital setting. So very applicable to what some of our students may be going through either themselves or trying to help their families at this time. On the right, um, from the first chapter of Staying Healthy, uh, we can see uh, it talks about how to, navigate, how to navigate the healthcare system. So where do I go when I am sick? How do I know what's an emergency? Again, how do I have a conversation with a healthcare professional? Because especially in times like this, the more clearly and the more confident uh, we can all be when we're communicating with a healthcare professional, the better care that we're going to receive. So also um, at this time, I think digital health literacy is very important. It's been very confusing, I think, for all of us to be able to understand all the different opinions, all the different information sources. Some people say this is a fact, some people say that is a fact. Um, let's help our students again to make it more simplified. And there's a couple of great curriculums that have already been developed uh, that require very little um, training or preparation on your instructor's parts. This is a new one, which I'm really impressed with. Um, it was put together by the National Libraries of Medicine and the Wisconsin uh, Health Literacy Organization. So it's developed by uh, adult literacy professionals. Let me see if I can show you a copy of that. So it's completely scripted. It has vocabulary terms, everything that you would need to do a digital health literacy uh, kind of section or classroom activity with your students. Medline Plus, which is another high quality source of health information, also has their own digital health literacy curriculum. Another area I think is really important for us to cover with our students would be self-care and mental health. And I think this is true for ourselves um, as individuals, as professionals, with colleagues, and also um, as educators. So this is recommendations from CDC, the best way that we can handle mental health. Again, as I told you, almost everything in this presentation is linked. So if you're interested in this um, handout, you can just click on it. But the things that we should keep in mind, taking care of our bodies. Um, I've been amazed at all of the, the free uh, exercise classes and services available online, um, whether it's doing a yoga class with Peloton, uh, the YMCA has been streaming on Facebook free exercise classes. There's so many different opportunities for us to take care of our bodies. Um, there's cooking classes, there's recipes for cooking materials that you have in your pantry. Um, I really kind of would say that this is a positive outcome of this event is we're really changing in terms of services being offered and what we can access online. It's also, I think, really important for us to connect with others and to have our students connecting. Again, there's been a lot of innovation. You know, with Netflix now, you can watch a movie with other people where you're all watching the movie at the same time. And we've probably all heard the news stories about Zoom being overwhelmed with people having parties and meetings. Um, get togethers and meals. So we have those opportunities. We just need to make sure that um, we structure them within our days. So staying informed is important, but as I mentioned, it's kind of a double-edged sword because we can also be harmed if we have too much exposure to news. So maybe choosing only a few times a day to access news or turning off push notifications, um, things like that could be useful for us in terms of our self-care. And then here are two uh, helplines. If you uh, do have students that you are concerned about or friends or family members, uh, both of these are bilingual helplines that are 24 hours a day. Uh, and a person doesn't necessarily have to be suicidal. They could just be having a tough day and need somebody to talk to. Uh, so the Florida blue one 
um, local to us and one of our great sponsors of our Health Literacy Program. I was so pleased to see that they have this helpline available. Here's a couple other resources for self-care and mental health. Uh, the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence has a great booklet, very easy to read, picture-based, just about navigating through uh, this kind of unprecedented time in our lives. So talking about feelings, talking about meditation, how to set up a consistent routine. So I'm, there's many more resources and that's why I was uh, encouraging you to post some of those because there's really some great stuff that has been put together. These are just a few that I, I selected to show to you today. Another part of our staying healthy curriculum is coping with stress. Uh, again, we do have both the teacher's guide as well as the student book. Talks a lot about stress in general, how to manage stress, how to identify the physical effects of stress. And the teacher's guide has activities and ideas and teaching tips for instructors who want to talk about stress. And these are all freely available online. Um, and in the future, you can also request to have print copies of these, although I know this doesn't really apply to us right now. But it's a good topic for us to cover during this crisis and moving forward as well. Headspace uh, is a pretty well-known um, resource as well, and they're offering free meditations and free kind of mental health assistance on their website. Uh, and the American Federation of Suicide Prevention also has some good resources for us. So the last thing I wanted to kind of mention about health resources would be a common question that we get, what's going on with health insurance? And I wish I had a clear answer for you. There has been a lot of talk, both I think within uh, Florida government, as well as within Congress of how to address the current need for health insurance, especially by those who have lost their jobs. To my knowledge at this point, there has not been a comprehensive plan put forward to pay for COVID-19 treatment for those who do not have insurance. However, make sure that those around you who have lost their jobs are aware um, that they could be eligible for COBRA. A COBRA is just an extension of health care benefits that they already received through their employer. Um, the difference is now the employee is paying the entire amount for the policy. The employer is no longer helping. Um, also with ACA, um, there is eligibility if you have had a major life change. Um, to enroll in a new policy, even though it's not currently open enrollment time. Also, uh, it's important, I think, to realize that many furloughed employees do still have some health care benefits. So if you are working with someone who's been furloughed, encourage them to talk with their HR department to see whether benefits are lasting longer uh, than, their, than their job. Okay, so now we're going to move on uh, to financial resources. Uh, I know this is something that is of great concern for many of us in the state, as well as around the country. So I just tried to highlight a few. These, this is not uh, an extensive list by any stretch, um, but we do also have additional resources on our website. The first one I wanted to talk about is food assistance. So of primary importance, obviously, is making sure that everyone in the state of Florida is well fed. So there's some really good kind of overarching websites that can help us identify where can we get food assistance in our community. So this is a site called Feeding Florida, and it provides uh, resources all over the state. Pretty much every church, food bank, mobile food pantry is listed in Feeding Florida. So I'll show you just kind of an example. I can search by my zip code. So again, I live in Orlando. And I can and zoom in. Sorry, it's not zooming where I want to go. So we'll look at Stark, <laughs> since that's where it chose. And it will tell me the name of the organization, the address, and the telephone number of the organizations providing food. So I think this is a great resource to try to put on your website or to try to get out to people in terms of locating, because it's really hard to know. There's so many different churches, so many different organizations that are doing amazing things right now. This is a great place to kind of get all that information. There has also been a comprehensive effort to make sure that children in the state of Florida are fed, um, and it's happening through the school system. But many of you probably heard in your county how they're handling it. For instance, in Orange County, uh, they are giving three meals a day. There's a pickup time. 
And originally parents would have to be there with their or kids would have to be there with their parents, but now they're just saying that parents can even pick up for their kids. And I'm kind of excited about a new program that is rolling out, I think, uh, in Central Florida in the next week. And they're saying probably the whole state by the end of the month called Feed the Need. This is being spearheaded by Four Rivers Barbecue, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, they're UCF grads who have started a, an organization called Four Roots. And their goal is to provide food for the whole family through the school system. So right now, at least in Orange County, um, I can go get, as I said, three meals for my, my, child, or my child or my children. Uh, they're hoping, again, by the end of the month that people can pick up food for their entire family. So that's kind of an exciting new program that's being offered. Another one that I've talked about before, if you've ever heard in my other webinars, is called Full Cart. This has been around for a while. Um, and basically, it's kind of a new idea on trying to provide um, boxes of food meal prep um, for people who are lower income. So in the past, the only charge was shipping. So I could order a box of food that would come to my house and I would just have to pay the shipping charge. I think currently now Full Cart is trying to ship food for free. So they're asking both for donations um, as well as asking people who are having financial difficulties um, to sign up and then they are trying to get out as much food as they can. So it's a great delivery option for a lower income family. And we'll talk about SNAP in just a moment, uh, but that's a government assistance program for food. So I just want to highlight now a little bit about the CARES Act that passed on March 27th, 2020 by Congress. I'm sure all of you have heard about it in the news, but I just wanted to make sure you knew some of the primary uh, parts of this act that could affect adult learners. So they're um, providing financial assistance to both small businesses and individuals. So there's been a lot of talk about the direct cash payment uh, system. I'm hearing in the news that distribution will likely start next week for those who have an electronic account already listed with the IRS. For a single person making less than $75,000, they can plan to see approximately $1,200. Married couples making less than $150,000, approximately $2,400, with $500 for each additional child. For families that make more than this, up to $199,000, uh, this distribution will be on a sliding scale. However, we're not quite sure how this distribution will go for people who do not have an electric, electric, excuse me, electronic account set up with the IRS or people who did not file taxes in 2018 and 19. So um, if you do have to rely on paper checks, unfortunately, it could be they're saying the end of the summer before people will get this really important direct cash payment. Um, if someone has not filed their 2019 taxes, they can do that now and list an electronic account. But to my knowledge, you can't go back now and try to enter that information. And Social Security recipients are also eligible for this payment, uh, and they do not need to file a tax return or do anything. They will receive it through their normal Social Security payment methods. The CARES Act also provides additional unemployment benefits through the Florida Reemployment Assistance Center, which we'll talk about in just a moment. It's providing reduced penalties for Americans who have a retirement account, a 401k account, and want to make withdrawals. It's providing a deferment for student loan payments for up to six months without penalty. And it's providing support for small businesses with economic loss, losses due to COVID-19. And speaking of taxes, um, they have uh, extended the deadline both to file and pay for federal income taxes until July 15th, 2020. So just a clarification on the coronavirus testing. The CARES Act um, is paying for free COVID-19 testing for patients without health insurance. In fact, in some places, they don't even uh, have to show their health insurance information at all. Uh, so there's not, at least that I could find, an overarching listing of all the places to be tested in the state of Florida. So the best place to go for that would be to ask your health care provider or local county health department. Um, many areas of the state do have the drive-in testing. I know we've got four or five locations here in Central Florida. There's quite a few in South Florida and I believe Jacksonville is doing it now as well. But this act does not cover treatment for positive cases of coronavirus. So I think there was some misunderstanding in the media 
that shouldn't keep someone from accessing health care, of course. Uh, if they are ill and need health care resources, they should move forward. Um, but at this point, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there has not been determined how the costs associated with the treatment will be paid. The Florida Department of Children and Families is also a fantastic resource for uh, Floridians. There's a lot of information, and I'm going to just click on the site real quick uh, for you to take a look at. But there's a lot of information there, and there's kind of one-stop shopping for several different programs. Um, through this site, people can apply for food assistance through SNAP. And currently, uh, according to a, um, our governor, he wants everyone to receive the maximum SNAP benefit, which is great news. So it's no longer going to be dependent on, um, on like a sliding scale of income. Medical assistance, signing up for programs can also be available as is temporary cash assistance for families with children. There's also a lot of good information about referrals for mental health, childcare, housing, and transportation assistance and literacy um, on this website. So these are the maximum monthly allotments uh, as of April, 2020. So this could give you an idea of a family if they are applying for SNAP, uh, the benefit amount that they would receive uh, with the additional money from the CARE Act. So again, this is their website. They have a lot of good information on COVID-19, but they also have um, access, as I said, to apply for uh, those specific programs here. The website is called Access Florida, and there's a lot of really good information. And as I mentioned, there's some good information here um, about other resources that uh, our adult learners might need at this time. So I think you've all probably heard uh, the Florida Reemployment Assistance Service Center has been in the news quite a bit lately. Uh, there's been an overwhelming demand in the state of Florida as well as around the country. Uh, and so uh, the, the state of Florida is really trying to change their system um, to be able to accommodate the large number of calls and applications that they have been getting. So under the CARES Act, workers who traditionally were not eligible for unemployment can be eligible for benefits under this CARES Act, as we mentioned. So that includes people who are self-employed, independent contractors, but as well, it includes people who are unable to work because they're infected with or caring for a family member with coronavirus, people who are quarantined due to possible exposure, but even people who are unable to work uh, due to childcare changes. So that's really kind of opened the scope of who is eligible for assistance under this program. It also includes people who might still be working uh, but are working reduced hours. So this week they rolled out actually two new websites and we're going to take a look at one that rolled out yesterday uh, and they have put all the individual and small business applications in one place so it's quite easy to use. You can also encourage um, people to use the phone number this listed but I hear that that's very difficult to get through on that as well. Uh, Career Source is another place as well as other community employment agencies they can also provide assistance with filing for benefits. So for someone who is really struggling, even with the application itself, which is uh, a little lengthy, uh, these employment resources could really be helpful in getting um, the unemployment forms completed. Some people are trying to access print copies of the form. Um, I have read that FedEx stores are now printing this for free. And I know a lot um, of our uh, state representatives are also having these available at their offices or outside their offices for people who do not have printers. So let's take a moment just to see the different programs that are being offered. Again, this is the new website that they have just rolled out. It has information for individuals, employers, and communities all in one place. So as I mentioned, we have the Reemployment Assistance Program which has additional funding thanks to the CARES Act. So higher uh, levels of compensation uh, than were previously available. And they do have applications in different languages. Here you can also find that paper application and a FedEx location uh, if you would like to use a paper copy. They also have job posting information on the site. 
And then we come down to uh, assistance programs for employers. So for many of you, this could be something that your organization should look forward, look to for additional funding during this difficult time. So the Small Business, uh, uh, Small Business Administration loans are also on here. Their Economic Injury Disaster Loan and Loan Advance Program. You can get more information and apply for it. The Small Business Administration Debt Relief Program, Paycheck Protection Program, in the state of Florida, we also have a small business emergency bridge loan program, a short time compensation program. Some stuff for smaller businesses, including this microfinance guarantee program, which is for businesses that are 25 people or less and who may have trouble with traditional uh, lenders. Black business loan program and the rebuild Florida business loan fund. So lots of different resources and uh, ability to get more information about these programs all on one website. So I was very pleased to see this and I think it will be really helpful to lots of Floridians. Uh, whether you can get through on these sites, I can't say yet. Um, my understanding is they have more servers and more bandwidth um, that have been devoted to it. But again, I don't think this has formally been rolled out yet. I actually found out about this site through um, my state representative. Many counties also have assistance programs. So if you click on this link, you can look at the contact information for all of the county governments throughout the state of Florida uh, and see what they may be able to offer as well. So I just wanna talk briefly about housing assistance. Again, I think this is an area that can be really confusing for um, adult learners. So our governor did suspend mortgage foreclosures and rental evictions for 45 days starting April 2nd, 2020. Additionally, federally backed mortgages provide for 120 day protection from foreclosures and rental evictions. And the start date for that is March 27th. This however, does not protect businesses, unfortunately, who may have leases or rental agreements for their businesses. But the big point that we want to illustrate is that this order does not relieve an individual from paying their obligation at the end of the period. And this can be very confusing. And even in the media and news articles that I've been reading, people seem to be quite confused about this. So this might be a great learning opportunity for students to start to understand about loans, mortgages. I know many of them may be renters and not owners, uh, but really this affects landlords as well. So I think we're all affected in terms of housing assistance. There's a link at the bottom of this page that has a lot of good information about forbearance. So forbearance is when a lender allows you to pause or reduce payments for a limited time. So I was hearing in the media, oh, you know, I can call my mortgage company and they won't make me pay my mortgage for three months. The fine print of that, when we are looking at cost payments, for example, is that at the end of that three months, I have to pay the entire amount, which for many families is not going to be realistic. So it really takes somebody with uh, financial literacy to be able to negotiate some of these changes. And that's something that we can offer, the skills and knowledge that we can offer just in general about credit cards, loans, mortgages. We can offer these skills and information to our students. Payment reduction is another option. That's when the full amount um, of, let's say my mortgage is $1,000, I'm only paying $500. I then have to pay the full amount that I need to make up at the end of the period. The benefit with this is often these periods are longer. With paused payment at ten, payments, it tends to be about three months. The payment reductions can stretch out over a year. The third option, which is probably the best option for most homeowners, is the paused payment loan extension. And this is when they take those payments, for example, the three months that maybe I don't pay my mortgage, and they extend the life of my loan and add it on at the end. So if I, for example, have 24 months left on my mortgage, we would add those three months at the end and I would then have 27 months left on my mortgage. So this can be very confusing. Um, there are HUD approved counseling, housing counseling counselors uh, that people can access for free. So if you click on this link, it takes you to a place where you can enter your zip code and find out where there are some counselors in your area. Unfortunately, as always, we have to worry about scams and probably even more so during this COVID-19 crisis. 
Um, I know in my own email, I get so many, in my work email, I get so many emails about purchasing masks, purchasing products, getting loans. So this is a great kind of opportunity for us to reach out to our students and talk about the potential for scams and how to protect ourselves financially. Um, so here's just a few things that people can look out for when we're talking about housing scams. And up here in the link, this can take you to um, the FTC page about uh, housing scams. But it, you know, if you're told you don't have to pay or you need to pay somebody else, wiring money is um, a big scam. So there's protections for that. Uh, so we really want to make sure that no one falls for these, these scams at this time. Utility assistance is another area that a lot of uh, Floridians need assistance with. So on a, the whole, the state of Florida has not suspended utility disconnection. However, many counties have moved forward with that. Uh, this is not an extensive list, but the, the few that I found were Brevard, Broward, Orange, Pasco, Volusia, um, have all suspended disconnections. And many providers themselves, like Florida Power and Light, Duke Energy, um, Orlando Regional Utilities Commission have suspended disconnection at this time too, which is really a wonderful thing for people who are in a, in a financially difficult situation right now. But customers still need to contact their utility company, just like with the mortgage. These bills are still going to have to be paid, but there's some great resources already established for people um, who might have trouble paying their bills. This is the guide to utility assistance in Florida. It's a pretty extensive guide of resources to assist people who are unable to pay their bills, as well as provides contact information for all of the major electric and water companies in the state. The Public Service Commission consumer line is also a good resource. Uh, if someone is having a difficulty negotiating with their company or feel like they're being treated unfairly, this consumer line can help them to negotiate and navigate that, that process. Other utilities that are really important at this time, and we're talking a lot about distance learning, talking about virtual classrooms. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful things that have been set up to help students who maybe did not have access to the internet previously. The FCC came up with a program called Keep Americans Connected Pledge and hundreds of broadband and telephone companies have signed on to this pledge. They are not uh, charging service termination fees, they're waiving late fees, and they're also opening the Wi-Fi hotspots all around their service areas. Another organization called everyoneon.org allows people to search by zip code to find affordable internet and phone options. There are a lot of discounted programs right now. AT&T, Verizon are all offering very low priced plans with high data uh, just for the next three months or so. So this is not a guaranteed permanent plan, but in the short term. So if I put in my zip code, I can fill out specific information about myself and then see uh, what there might uh, be in terms of resources for me. All right. Also, there is free K-12 educational broadband and hotspot access by both Spectrum and Comcast. So the goal is for all Floridians to have internet access during this difficult time. Some additional sources of financial assistance. Um, I know I'm talking about it at the end, but that doesn't minimize its importance. The United Way of Florida and their 211 resource finder is really essential for a lot of people. You can call 211 to ask about any variety of community resources. So it's a wonderful free way for people to find out about how to pay their utilities, how to access healthcare, uh, and how to find food in their area. We also identified a few other foundations that are offering financial assistance. As we mentioned, if you know of others, we would love to continue to update this list, but the Southwest Florida Community Foundation is offering grants, Miami Foundation, the Restaurant Relief Fund and Tipped and Service Worker Relief Fund are all offering uh, economic assistance to people who are out of work. And overall, we mentioned a little bit about the housing scams, but there are many different scams that are going on currently um, 
you know, during this crisis. So we want to make sure that we keep people aware of what those are, offers for testing, vaccines, cure, air filters, and masks. I saw a story on the news, unfortunately, that in Miami, there was an organization setting up uh, false testing, drive-through testing areas, and people were going in and paying for what they thought were COVID-19 tests, and they weren't. So, I mean, people are very bold in what they will try to achieve in terms of scamming people. Charity scams, person in need scams have taken off. So you might get a phone call and you can't believe caller ID because you might get a phone call from a friend or a family member saying that they're sick and in the hospital and need help. So that would be a really scary situation. So we just have to always verify any kinds of requests that we get, even from family members. There's been a lot of social security and medical benefit scams as well as fake online shopping sites for supplies. A great virtual classroom activity uh, put together by FTC, you could play scam bingo with your students online. Great way to build vocabulary uh, and be able to talk about all these different uh, tactics that are being used by unscrupulous people. Another virtual classroom idea for financial literacy would be to help uh, start to think about how to prioritize the essentials. We've heard from a lot of people that they're, cons they're um, confused about what bills do I pay and how do I kind of get through this crisis until I get some assistance. So here's some clear steps of what we can recommend that people do. That they review their income and other sources of money, and come up with a figure, calculate their essential living expenses, calculate their other fixed debts, so basically the, the budgeting types of things that we talk about with our students with financial literacy all of the time. What's a little bit different is helping people to prioritize those. So we start with those essential living expenses. Can we pay those? If we can't, how do we call and negotiate with those companies? If we can, then we move on to the next category, the other fixed debts. And we look at loans or credit cards. How do we negotiate that if we're unable to pay? So really it's about organizing, prioritizing, and figuring out uh, what is essential need, how much do we owe, and what creditors will work with us. Uh, Schwab MoneyWise has a great budgeting tool. I mean, there's many. We have a lot listed on our website as well. Wells Fargo has great budgeting tools uh, through hands-on banking. I kind of like this one in terms of what we're talking about right now, because you can easily enter expenses and income and take a look at the end to see where you're at. So I could start by putting in, okay, if I make $2,000 a month, then I can put in my rent, let's say that's $800 a month. And I can start to see how much I have left. So I can start doing that prioritizing process by putting in each bill individually to kind of see where I'm ending up. So a great classroom suggestion would be to come up with a scenario, just have a, a general person, because we don't want to put anybody on the spot so we could make up a person. So you could say, you know, Heather has lost her job, here are her bills, how could she budget and figure out uh, what she can pay and what she needs to contact her creditors about. And the second piece of that activity could be students writing a script for their conversation. Because if students, especially those who have lower level English skills, are trying to call their creditors, we want them to be prepared for the types of questions that might be asked and prepared for how they can actually talk and describe the situation to the creditor. Again, down here is a good link um, with information of what to do if you can't pay certain bills. So this one's about credit cards specifically but this is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But if you look under their COVID topics, um, they have all kinds of information to help consumers, how to avoid scams, how to stay on top of your finances. They talk about mortgages, student loans. It's a great resource and everything is written in plain language format. So here are some good, just basic financial literacy curriculums. Again, it doesn't require an instructor to develop their, their own program. There's a lot of things that are already available. 
Hands-on banking is one that we use a lot. Wells Fargo has been a great sponsor of our financial literacy program, and they have a very extensive uh, hands-on banking financial education program. But all of these other ones as well, mymoney.gov, uh, it was and Money Smart um, are both for lower level learners, so they're fantastic curriculums as well. Also want to mention IFAS. Uh, University of Florida has what they call IFAS extension offices in every county, but virtually they've been doing a, a wide range of webinars for consumers about handling financial problems, about cooking healthy food, parenting, a lot of great resources coming out of the um, IFAS extension offices in Florida. So a few additional resources, obviously our Florida Literacy Coalition uh, resource pages. I hope everyone on here, uh, won't click, hope everyone on here has been to the FLC site, but we're continually updating our information that we have about both health information, uh, teaching and classroom information, digital learning, as well as financial literacy. I just took you to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, also another great resource. And lastly, I don't always recommend this, but the New York Times, in my opinion, has done a fantastic job at developing plain language charts, graphs, articles. So I think they could really provide you with some good teaching information. Um, if you want to have articles read by your class, they have a lot of plain language stuff. This is the most comprehensive website that I have seen for assistance. Uh, it's amazing how much they have. So basically, they've done like an FAQ format. Um, all about how coronavirus has affected our lives. So if you want to ask just about the pandemic in general, all kinds of things about money. So, and I haven't read every single one, but I will say the ones that I have read have been high quality information and again, written in a pretty plain language format. So just so many resources here. Uh, so it might be a little overwhelming for an adult learner, but it would be great for an instructor to try to get some information um, on basic questions, or you could even maybe weekly or daily take a section uh, and answer or use the information in smaller chunks. So I just want to mention we do have another webinar uh, next week called Virtual Insanity. You can click on this link uh, to register for it. It's on Monday the 13th from 3 o'clock to 4.15, and that will assist you as you're trying to develop your distance learning programs. And lastly, there's also another uh, important webinar I think that would be useful that's put on by one of our partners, the Florida Prosperity Partnership. They're doing one next Wednesday at two o'clock about the CARES Act and how you can better serve people who are unbanked or underbanked, which means either they don't have a bank account or even if they do, they're not currently really utilizing it to its full potential. So thank you everyone. And I'd be interested to hear if anyone has any questions or additional resources. Um, we have a, a few questions here in regards to um, sending the information um, after the webinar. Um, so I have some questions here. Uh, will you send out the PowerPoint at the end of the webinar? Um, Definitely. And, and would, would we be able to share, the, share this in a link that's uh, in a format where they can click on the resources? That's a great question. Yes, yeah, so this PowerPoint was developed for your use, however you would like to use it. If you would like to take some slides out and use it in your own presentation, if you want to use the links on your own website, feel free to use this however it best serves your organization. And I also and just wanted to... Question. Okay, that's it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I also just wanted to bring up uh, floridaliteracy.org. As I said, we'll be continually updating um, our website so you can get the most up-to-date information possible uh, about our webinars, and also about resources. So if you click on health literacy, for example, uh, you're going to see many of the resources that we've talked about, uh, the Staying Healthy, which you can download right from here. We have lesson plan banks, other kinds of resources, facts, a lot of information on our website. We also have a health literacy 
online training course for instructors and tutors. So if somebody hasn't really delved into the topic of health literacy with their students, we have a two hour training course that might help them become uh, more uh, confident in their teaching and also help increase their awareness of all the fantastic resources. We also have, as you see on the screen, our health literacy quiz app. This is another fun interactive way to work with students uh, during distance learning. It is unfortunately only available for Android uh, devices at this time, but teachers can have contests and games using that app with their students. And a lot of the resources that we talked about in terms of health are already available on our website, and we will continue to update that. A lot of great videos. We love the short plain language videos as uh, teaching aids. We also have a financial literacy resource page. So have to look and see. It's not up quite yet, but look back in the next day or so, and you'll see many of the resources that we just discussed in the webinar on that page as well. Any other questions or comments, Nicole? Um, there are no other questions right now. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. We hope that we were able to provide you with some useful resources. Again, I encourage you to reach out to any one of us, myself included, if we can help you find additional resources or if you need additional ideas of ways to uh, teach this information in the classroom. I hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Have a great afternoon.